Eve. I'm here with my very good friend, August 34, dear to Wadding. And we've been friends for a very long time. We were trying to figure out last night how long, how long and we gave up. Right. Neil McKean. <laughs> Neil McKean. Um, we kind of feel like we've known each other forever, but it's probably around the 20 year mark. <laughs> yeah, in or around. Maybe, maybe less. I'm not really sure. But yeah, yeah certainly yeah, a, a strong there. bond. Yes. So, um, I hear you're a Wiccan now. <laughs> oh, did you know? It's a black magic Wiccan witch cult bent on destroying all the sacred sites of the land. No, all joking aside. <laughs> People, <laughs> let's not go there. No. There are some strange people about. However, so how did you kind of come into this Irish paganism thing and tell us a little bit about your priestess journey? There's a question in from Gemma, was it? Yeah, Gemma McGowan. Okay, yeah, um, another lovely asked, sister. Yes. Asked Hi, Gemma. Gemma. <laughs> um, asked about your priestess journey specifically. So, do you want to kind of back us into that a little bit? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, it probably started when I was quite young, as in the journey, as opposed to actually becoming a priestess. Mm. So, like probably the majority of people in this country, I grew up in a very Catholic household. Um, I took that very seriously. I think, you know, like anyone who's a spiritual person, you kind of work within the framework you have. I didn't know any other framework. I wasn't exposed to any other framework. I. I think maybe, as we were chatting last night, was it I, I could maybe have been a bit of a mystic or something mm. if it was other times. Um, I had a very strong personal relationship with like my guardian angel mm. um, to the extent of asking for the answers to sums in school and stuff. And you know, I thought that was normal actually. Yeah. I thought that was the way everyone <laughs> did it, but it turned out it wasn't. But I think in terms of what started my love for let's say the sacred the magic in the land and in our sort of indigenous kind of traditions was mythology mm -hmm. I was a very young early reader a very avid reader spent hours and days in the library which was quite near to our house um, and mythology was my main interest in terms of reading so I just read and read and read and then I suppose around the age of maybe about 14 um, I came across Horselip's Book of Invasions of the Thine. Mm. I always quote them because they kind of, I look at it now, I work shamanically, and that use of the drum to induce that light, trance, hypnosis, aid the soul flight, mm. I actually think those albums did that for me when yeah. I was that age, yeah. sort of transported me into the world I was familiar with from mythology and from my engagement with the stories. But the music had the ability to kind of lift you in yeah. through the threshold. Yeah. So I think that definitely was a start. Um, I had experiences in my late teens of really waking up to this church that I had grown up in has no place for me in it. I had my first pregnancy at the age of 18 and suddenly my whole world changed. I spent time in a mother baby home. It essentially threw me off the rails, but in a very well masked way to the extent that I kind of became obsessed with the only thing that would make me feel okay would be to have another child that I could keep. And then the trauma, the panic, the damage from the previous loss and separation and glossing mm. a big chunk of traumatic life into yeah. a few minutes of conversation. And thank you for sharing. But I essentially repeated the, the the pattern because I thought I can't actually go through with this and the panic and what would happen in my family and all the rest. But those traumas, the grief, the loss, the being involved in that mother and baby home system, although I did not experience direct abusiveness towards me, but it was the being a pariah, the being somehow you had now put yourself outside of... It was know, institutional yeah, abuse rather than the good, the good yeah. people. Um, it really started me examining who I was, what that belief system had for me. And, you know, I would say within another year or two of that, I had very much felt there is not a space. You know, there was, there were, there was more kind of longer story than that. But in the condensed way, there was no space for me to be who I needed to be in that church. 
So I was searching for meaning. I was searching for something. And I suppose the foundation of, let's say, the, the Irish traditional indigenous, you know, what was coming from the land was already yeah. in there from yeah. my earlier life. Um, my first kind of, I suppose, dipping into um, practice would have been Wiccan. Um, our good friend Barbara Lee, I knew, I knew mutual friends who had been, hi Barbara, <laughs> who had been going to Barbara's coven, and um, you know, I had at, at the age of fifteen now, I had come across Gerald Gardner's Witchcraft Today book and bought it in a second hand shop in Galway called the Peddler. Wow. I bought I bought Dylan's Blood on the Tracks the same day, so there were two <laughs> relationships that kicked off that day, um, and I had sort of read it off and on over time, and. I learned loads from attending the coven. It wasn't kind of my exact path. Mm. So I didn't know what it was. Yeah. So it took it took a lot of searching. It took a lot of dipping into this, dipping into that. Studied astrology, studied tarot. Tarot kind of brought me deeper in. But I still wasn't hitting that the priestess vocation. I came across Fellowship of Isis then. Um, was very interested in it. Really enjoyed going to... The ICM that I was attending in Sandy Mount with a number of people I knew from the Astrological Association at Mines. And it was probably when I came across Celtic shamanism. Mm. I mean, that's a very broad term as well, Celtic. But it was that kind of awareness of shamanism wasn't just about being, you know, a medicine man or woman it wasn't about being a shamanka the Samai people it wasn't just about being a sangoma in Africa that we had our own indigenous shamanism mm. and really kind of been drawn to that so it was when I encountered Coach Brannigan who's a wonderful friend hello Coach if you're out there fantastic woman amazing priestess amazing uh, shamanic practitioner and um, just gifted in so many ways came across her so I thought, I'm really interested in this. And did the initial journey to go, is this my path? And it was absolutely, yeah, pursue mm -hmm. this. And then moving from there to um, attend the courses in Celtic Shamanism with uh, Kathleen, or some people call her Caitlin Matthews, over in the UK. That was what brought me back into the more Irish. Now, as I kind of, um, I suppose, began practising it became less Celtic and more Irish, if you know what I mean. Although in my Fellowship of Isis priestess ordination, it was the Welsh goddess Ariane Rod who called me. It's really interesting, mm -hmm. you know, for me. And I definitely feel a pull and a link to Wales and the Welsh stuff. And I suppose that kind of devotion to the Kailach and the Dark Goddess that I would very much have, um, I think any of us women who've been through trauma of any kind, you know, we find an ally and a friendship yeah. in the dark goddess. Yeah. So it's been a rambling path. Um, I think the path to becoming a priestess started in my childhood, certainly by my early teens. But it was a long and varied route to get there. Mm. So my ordination within Fellowship of Isis um, in 2004 would have been what kind of copper fastened it as mm -hmm. this is now an act of service. So for me, I make a distinction in some ways, although I'm one person, so it's all part of who I am. The Fellowship of Isis work is very much of ceremonial priesthood. Yeah. You know, that the act of service, the commitment to the community, the wider community. Whereas I would see myself as a shamanic priestess and that my work of the land essentially is what informs my daily practice, what I'm imbued with, yeah. what I kind of believe I would radiate from me. Yeah. And it has inspired me to want to offer a training for yeah. people who just want to work with this land, this mythology and our language. Yeah. And like for me that that breaks up I'm, I'm actually writing a book on pagan priesthood right now and it breaks up into the the pastoral functions and the sacerdotal yeah. functions yeah. so you've got the basically the outer work and the inner work you know and 
those are both valid kind of paths through priesthood and yeah. you know you can you can just be a pastoral priest or you can just be a sacerdotal yeah. priest you don't have to have community engagement you don't have to have no absolutely i mean i, feel I don't like think you, you can do the outer without the inner yeah being there. i was going to say i feel yeah. like you like you do obviously need to have a connection to deity you need to have a connection to whatever that means for you because that's essentially what priesthood is yeah. so so there, there does have to be a core of the inner but sacerdotal is bigger than that it's it's more than just your personal connection it's whether you're teaching or training yeah. or sh you know channeling for other people yeah. or you know so it's it's the bringing of your inner work into a, like a community space even though like it could be two people or it could be like a mm. public ritual you know i think those. look i mean for people who maybe aren't familiar there's a really easy analogy if we look at Christian monks and nuns mm. that we've always had the you know the contemplative orders mm. who who pray so essentially that's like the inner work yeah. of the being that vessel for the divine energy yeah. and yeah. sort of sending out that energy and you can do that without engaging in the world at all yeah but then there were the the, the teaching and the the, non the nursing yeah. and the all that no, ideally so we're not we're not <laughs> no we're not saying let's all but I think it helps people who maybe don't understand yeah. that distinction that yeah. like well we've all probably grown up looking at yeah. that yeah. you yeah. know and it's a similar yeah. division in a way um i mean i know we we opened with a joke here but like looping back to some of what you said you know about your your path through it you know you you had to touch on non-native teaching to kind of find your way through because like myself you know yeah. there's at the time, there there wasn't anything available. There was no internet. There was no yeah, you know. Exactly. There was no books really. There was there wasn't anybody teaching workshops or classes or anything like that. Or if they were, they were very very underground. You know. Yeah. So a lot of us in Ireland have had to to go through a lot of like foreign filters to try and get to a, like a, a native priesthood or an indigenous kind of expression of our spirituality, yeah. and we've had to learn from other sources to try and understand what what we're feeling from the ground up here would yeah. you agree with that or? i would i mean i think look at the end of the day i think our main template is the mythology yeah so always back to the story it's always back <laughs> it is always back to the story yeah. so no two ways about it that's, it's that's for me <laughs> yeah and you know we let's be really honest we don't have an unbroken line no we can you know we can either in a scholarly way or in a kind of intuitive way through journeying and all of that glean from our mythology we can glean from the bardic text and what was written down and then we always have to remind ourselves that that was through the filter mm -hmm. of christianity because it was only at that time it got written down there's nothing pure so <laughs> we cannot and i mean i challenge anybody out there who says i'm in a broken line of druids or witches Sorry, I, you know, with the greatest of respect, I call bullshit. I call bullshit because we don't have that. No. We have subtext, we have speculation, we have scholarly surmisings, yeah. but that's the best we can do. Yeah. So our plugging into the earth and actually allowing ourselves, and I think that's what priesthood is, to be a vessel, you know, mm -hmm. allowing ourselves to let that energy come through us and then of course we have to have checks and balance we can't be just making up shit like mm. do you know what i mean we mm. can't be just letting our own fantasies run away with us and and yeah we need to actually go okay now touch can we back this yeah. up there are yeah. touchstones in the stories there are touchstones in the mythology there's touchstones as well with other people's experience like when i was working guardianship effectively at ralph Crohan. yeah my job there was to facilitate people having their own experiences when I brought them on cave tours or, you know, they wanted to come and meet Maeve mm. or the Morrigan or whatever. That wasn't my place to give them an experience. Yeah. I was there in a guardian role and a facilitation role. Yeah. But what I did gather over the, you know, 15 years I was doing that, and I'm still doing that, is the commonalities and the patterns of people's individual yeah. experiences. So, you know... Again, those are the touchstones. Yeah. Like in the cave, for example, um, a really, really common theme is the need to to 
verbalize or vocalize to make sound yeah you know? so it was singing for me in yeah. that cave yeah and like that i can't even count the amount of people that you know i've either had to prompt them through yeah. her like yeah. you know she's been pushing me to prompt them speak yeah you know she has come through me and I'm, i end up speaking irish to people and knowing full well that they don't understand the irish I don't even understand some of the Irish that I'm not fluent, you know, yeah, and I'm yeah. still speaking it. I can't, I can't mentally translate it, and I'm not allowed to translate it for them because it's it's about the the, the vocalization. It's about the sound that's yeah. being made in yeah. the cave in that space, and that's the sacredness of it. So that to me is one of those touchstones, you know, just one example of one particular site, but you know that is. Like there's a there's a mound, um, you know, when you look at the archaeology and the, the mythology and the local folklore, there's a mound in the Rathcarhunk or a, a triumphalish ring fort actually, triple ringed, um, which is called Rath Ra. Yeah. Which is the, the mound of the speaking. And I don't think those things are unconnected. No, I'm sure. You know? Not. And the the sound, one of the first experiences I had in the cave was was um the sound of the um, the old horns, the uh, reconstructed Iron Age, the, drums, the Bronze Age, yeah. and, and Iron Age trumpets, and um, being played down there at Samhain. Wow! You know, and um, you know, if you're squeamish, block your ears right now, and um, that actually brought on blood flow for me. Okay. I'd like totally out of sync with my cycle and everything, you know, yeah. but I had a I had a visceral physical reaction to the horns and the drums yeah. in the cave. Wow. And. Like, so all of those things are linked. And I think it's our job as like modern pagan, Irish pagan priesthood yeah. to collect those patterns. I agree. And to try and retell those yeah. stories in a way that makes sense for our communities yeah. now. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. So it's not about being right or being pure or being whatever. It's about observing. It's about, you know, putting the work in and, and yeah. you know, building that right relationship with the land with yeah, the yeah i think that's the most that is the most that's important where it comes thing. From. that is where yeah. it comes from and you know if possible use the language mm. even if it's only a couple of phrases even if it's the only as you're kind of addressing and calling in deity you know the paragus vulture come yeah. and be welcome okay well why don't you the... give people a few phrases that they can give you deirdre is our is, is a gale gore one of one of our gale gores <laughs> I'm, like people say to me are you fluent and i will i'll never say i'm fluent because i'm not i'm not fluent i'm i'm what i call very good <laughs> which you know i i would definitely like to deepen and uh, strengthen my own irish but i have enough of a command that i can use it fairly comfortably and confidently and can share what i have so okay well i mean i think for anyone who opens circle and if you call on any being, deity, uh, you know, spirits of place or whatever, you can just say glam er, I call on, and then name whoever you're calling. That's really so, simple. Glam er on Morrigan. Yeah. Glam er Morian, great queen. Or glam er Dante, glam er whoever. Um, and then when you've done your inviting and the calling, and you want to say, you know, be, be welcome, like your equivalent of, of hail and welcome. You say par, August Fáilte. Well, everyone knows Fáilte, you know, Cape Mila Fáilte, welcome. So par, come, August Fáilte, come and you're welcome. And so then when you're, when you're uh, closing your circle at the end and you want to say, well, thank you, because obviously if we've, we've invited someone in, they've come and they've been in our space and they've assisted us with our work and they've shared their energy with us and guidance and protection and whatever. We want to be polite human beings and say thank you very much for being here. So we say buiacus, buiacus, thank you. It's kind of slightly more poetic than the Gaur of Mahogod, which is also thank you and is also nice. And we might remember better from school. I like buiacus. So buiacus. Maureen, Buiacus, Dante, Buiacus Lou, Buiacus whoever. Mm -hmm. And then you want to say, so farewell now, you know, hail and farewell. Um, and with blessing, so Slán agus Bánach. Farewell and blessing. And that's really simple. So if you just incorporate that, just that, you've now done your inviting and your, uh, 
you know, your thanks and closing in our native tongue. And you go, hey, I've just done that. Brilliant, <laughs> you know? So little things like that are important, I think, you know. I personally feel, and I know some of you will have heard me say this before, that there is a different response from the land. Yeah. And from the beings, when you spirits use the of the land, there, when you use the land, so qualitative yeah. difference. Yeah. yeah. You know? Um, you know, I mean, ever since I even, I suppose I would have started getting it publicly, like when I wrote the first book and I was so adamant, um, like in Irish Witch Prep and Irish Witch. And I was like, I was only 25 when I wrote mm, that I book. Know. And I was so, you know, full of the vim and vigour about, you know, you have to speak the language and like really knock people over the head with it. And I think for a lot of our, our US comrades, um, there were, it was kind of the first time that they were really being like confronted with this, like in, you know, and I, I know I can be a little bit confrontational sometimes. <laughs> I, I'm aware I'm not so. I know. <laughs> I'm sure nobody's ever noticed that. <laughs> I'm not a subtle person, that's okay. But, you know, it, it really put a lot of people on the defensive, you know? I know. And, and I mean, you can see it from the Amazon comments. Like, who the fuck did I think I was expecting people to like learn a, a different language, you know? But like, it just, it keeps coming back to that for me. Of, like, in fairness you know, now, yeah. look at people who do like Egyptian mysteries mm. and then they'll learn some. Yeah. Like, I, I know people even in Fellowship of Isis who use some, you know, in some of the prayers. Uh, people who will learn Hebrew because they're into doing Kabbalistic stuff. So, quite honestly, people, mm. I don't think it's too much to ask. No, you know, be no. It's not too much to ask. <laughs> and you know what? There's so many programs these days for like, learn a language in 20 minutes a day and, yeah. you know, just make it part of your engagement with the land. Yeah. And okay, if somebody's like dyslexic or they've difficulty or whatever, it's not about becoming a scholar in the yeah. written or the, you know, the, the reading of the language. It's about just learning how to address beings of place and deity associated with a land and a culture where this was, is the language of the land. And I honestly don't think it's too much to ask. No. And I'm just going to pull that one up because um, uh, with regards to dyslexia, um, I was listening to a podcast called Mother Folklore, which is brilliant, actually. There's a there's an Irish language, yeah, yeah. Irish language resource for you. Um, and, oh, I want to say Gara Jean, but it might not have been her. There's a couple of different presenters that they kind of have in on a rotation. Yeah. Um, so apologies if I have her name wrong. Um, but she was talking about being dyslexic and growing up dyslexic. And she, she came to Irish later and learned yeah, it yeah. after going through the school system and she now speaks like eight different languages or something wow. right but you know her her take on it and I'm not dyslexic so I'm not this is this is me not being dyslexic and you yeah, know yeah, passing yeah. on somebody's words who are who is and um, her take on it was that Irish was a lot easier for her to learn than to try and get her head around English because the grammar rules are, are quite solid like and they stay the they same. are and i mean there's lots of exceptions and all the rest yeah. but i mean i think the main point is it's not about people necessarily learning it to a scholarly standard no, or no. being able to read or write an essay you know, or you really know great novels yeah. in irish yeah. or whatever i mean which are fantastic if yeah. you do want to go that <laughs> route but it's not about that it's about being able to communicate in the language of the land yeah and you know i've always kind of likened it to where you know, most people when they go on holidays, like they're going to pick up a word or two. That's it. You yeah. know, it's respectful. It is respectful. You know, rather than expecting. That's and actually not a good that way people, to put it. Yeah, it's not you that know. people in that country that you're visiting don't speak English because yeah. most of them do. You yeah. know, most of them will do. But if you turn around to them and speak, say something to them, even if you're struggling with it, if you say something to them in their own language, they yeah. they respect it. Yeah, and they react positively to it, and it just, again, it's building that right relationship with the deities, with the beings yeah. that you're working with. Yeah. It's it's making the effort. It's, it's making the them. effort. That's yeah. exactly what it is, yeah. and it it shows that intent to put effort and energy into it. Yeah, I think yeah. you know. Yeah, and 
you know, for a lot of us as pagans, and you know, especially if we're going a priesthood route, you know, there are daily devotionals, there are you know offerings that can be made, and learning the language can go in under all of those categories. Yeah, absolutely, you know? absolutely, yeah. And it's a very valuable kind of use of yeah of the you know your daily devotional. Well, time. look, as I say, I was called to um, dedicate to the Welsh goddess Ariamna, so I mean, for me, it was important to just learn. Just I cannot speak Welsh, mm. but just how to welcome and thank you yeah. just yeah you know what I yeah. mean so I think it is important I think it's a responsibility that we need to take on you yeah. know yeah. interestingly mm. and I may have said this before uh to you when we you were involved as well in in one of the quarters for that that um standing rock, stand and rock the ceremony yeah. some of you might have been there um it's about two years ago now, at the on the hill of Oshnock, our sacred site, we did a ceremony to send solidarity energy out to the people of Standing Rock. There were some people with me from Wexford there who are more activists. You know, that's how we're connected through activism and politics as opposed to through spiritual work. Yeah. And a couple of them had had real issues with the Irish language in school because of the way it's been taught. Mm. But they actually said it was the first time ever that they had felt a sense of, I'd really like to speak it. Because of the context in which it was used, yeah. they could feel the energy and the meaningfulness of it. Mm -hmm. And these were people who were not coming from spiritual practice. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that was really, really interesting yeah. and really powerful yeah. and really important to hear, you know? Yeah. And I think for Irish people, like we were talking about it earlier um, off camera, <laughs> yeah. for Irish people, there is a hangover of you know, guilt or even shame about our language because it was, you know, it was it was literally bet out of us for generations and, and you know that that stays with you in your in your DNA like mm. that. Those memories stay with you and that trauma stays with you. So for Irish people who maybe find themselves dismissive or embarrassed about speaking the language, um I would say maybe kind of sit with that. Because it's an important thing to be aware of and to acknowledge. And I was saying to Deirdre that, you know, myself and John, like we, we try and use the language as much as we can. But, you know, there have been situations where we've been out in public and, and speaking Irish to each other. And, and I I find, I find mortified was actually the word I used. Yeah. You know, and I find this, this like really deep seated mortification. And like that is not coming from me I know yeah. that that's not coming for me so it, it is worth just having a little kind of sit down and a little think yeah. about your own relationship with Irish as an Irish person um, and just examine there might be nothing there and that's fine mm. you know but if there is something or if you find just that like some people will couch it in, oh, I was just taught really badly at school and had really bad experience. That is school. also, and it is true. I mean, there was, a, very there was true. brutality yeah. no, associated very, with very it being true. rammed down people's throats yeah. and then, look, with anything, it's yeah. going to turn you off. Of course yeah. it is, you know? Yeah, but that also then becomes a kind of a, a mask for maybe some deeper rooted stuff as well. You know, people are able to kind yeah. of Yeah, I mean, push I think, I think in some category. cases that is it. Yeah. But it's like, it's also, it's not just even that it was ram down people's thoughts it's being taught so badly mm -hmm. like we don't learn conversation to language. be quite honest like you look at a child goes into school at the age of five they come out at the age of 18. it's like 13 years learning a language now you wouldn't really think after 13 years learning any language that you'd be fluent mm. people aren't no. and why are they not actually i'd recommend anybody who hasn't seen it it's old now, but get hold of um the comedian Des Bishop's series. Oh, it's brilliant! In the name of yes. the Father. Yeah. And he brilliant. kind of he really proves the point. He gives himself yeah. twelve months to learn the Irish language. Yeah. yeah. And it's really interesting because he he does end up quite critical of exactly what we've just articulated there. Yeah. And it is a question mark that like the education system in this country has to ask. Mm. You know, why? why are people coming out? Yeah. With the bare kukla fuckle after 13 years of study mm -hmm. you know yeah and why is there this like reticence about it as well you know it's 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 all just so tangled yeah you know it really is a tangled thing and like all of that being said though 
you know, and I, I'm glad that we kind of covered that because I think that there is a, a tendency to dismiss it. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm dyslexic or I, I, I never learned a language or, yeah. you know, I, 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 I'm not smart enough or all these things that I've heard people say. Or, you know, I hate Irish because of I have bad experiences yeah. in school, yeah. you know. And it is kind of easy to just slide on by that one. So, yeah. you know, to loop it back then, like, it's worth it. You know, it is. Whatever, whatever coup and fuck or whatever, especially in a spiritual context, whatever phrases you can bring in, whatever acknowledgement you can bring in, you're just, you're bypassing yeah. so much stuff and you're just getting to the next level, like, yeah. all, almost automatically, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, you're not, there's loads of other levels after that, yeah. but, you know, you're just, you're going deeper with it automatically with your pagan practice, your Irish pagan practice. I agree. I you know, think it does. It adds a layer. That like a shortcut. You know, yeah, <laughs> but it definitely adds yeah. a layer um, that brings an extra depth. You know, it's yeah, yeah. It's not about beating people over the head and going, "You don't speak yeah. Irish. You can't be a real." You know, it's not yeah. that. It's just give it a go because yeah. it's actually really something that will enhance yeah. your practice and it's you know? beautiful you know it is it's so poetic yeah. it's so beautiful the way yeah. things are phrased in irish the way the way we can express ourselves um particularly for anybody with with irish ancestry yeah it's it's a much more natural form of expression yeah you know yeah. And, and it it resonates it's very flowy yeah you know yeah yeah. She's in the fear not good. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have any other questions? Quick question <clears throat> from Janet Nihulaman, who was wondering where did she get her drum? She being me? Yes. She being you. <laughs> she being me. Where, where Hi, did Janet. Deirdre? I um, beg your pardon, where did Deirdre get her drum? Um I had that drum actually was made for me when I was doing my training with Kathy Matthews in the UK. Um it was split between two different centres. There was the um, Earth Spirit Centre in Compton, Dundon, near Glastonbury, and uh, Hogwood College in Stroud in Gloucestershire. And both those places had really strong resonance for me. But at Compton, Dundon, uh, in the churchyard there, there was like a very ancient yew tree. It was, oh, I don't know, over 1700 years old. It's one of the ancient yews. And I made a very strong connection with that yew tree. So actually it was the assistant uh, tutor on my shamanic courses. Uh, fantastic woman, real absolute earth goddess of a woman that just sat in her own power and was so fantastic. She's now passed into the other world. So I will send her my love. Jane Dagger, fantastic name. Um, she made wonderful things with lit skin and so on. So she made that drum for me and the painting on it, which she did is of the yew tree, the Compton Dundon yew tree. And she found um, a piece of stick on the ground that had fallen from a branch. So the beater is actually made with a stick that came from the tree. So it carries the energy of the tree. Because in my initial journeys, that tree, which has a kind of a hollow in it, was one of the first entrance and exits for me into the other world. So it was very, very meaningful, that drum. So Jane is no longer around to make a drum, but I have heard extremely good reports of a Dahi Dove up in the west of Ireland who does drums. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, he's on Facebook. I don't know if that's the name of the drums, but check out Dahi Dove. And I have heard the drums. Um, a, a wonderful woman called Sarah Humble that I know. don't know if she's around, but if she is, hi, Sarah. Um, has uh, has Dahi's drums that you can do workshops and make them yourself, as far as I understand. Uh, beautiful sound, like beautiful sound. So, yeah. And how... I kind of know the answer to this, but maybe other people don't. Mm. Um, how strongly does the drum feature in your practice? Hugely. The drum is like an extension of myself. The drum is like another limb. I mean, I just, the idea of being parted from my drum would be like just really heartbreaking. I do know of somebody who once was told by the guides that she had to 
burn her drum and I think that was like the ultimate sacrifice you know but for me yeah the drum is very much part of not just my spiritual practice but like everything I do that kind of carries that energy into the world so some of you will know that I'm an activist as well involved with people before profit and involved in lots of campaigns and protest marches and so on I carry that drum into that work because for me that drum is carrying the energy and the rhythm of the earth it's also because of usage it is imbued with the energy of my practice and my connection with deity and mm. guides so using the drum it it aids the energy to move it aids the consciousness to move and to cross or to journey into the other world on a protest it sort of keeps that energy of the chance and the rhythm of the chance together you know mm -hmm. so it's very important the drum is actually extremely important it's like look the the earliest sound any of us hear is the heartbeat of our mother when we're in the womb and the heartbeat of mother earth is with us all the time and the drum is kind of actually i think how we vocalize that mm -hmm. heartbeat you know yeah yeah one of my earliest journeys back before i like really knew what journeying was i've been doing it like i've been in and out of the other world as a child mm. for my whole life but before i kind of figured out what i was doing really um was to uh like a war march maybe yeah in ireland mm. you know but i was like a part of a mass you know and bones and shields was like so it was before drums yeah almost. it was yeah um and it was it was such a visceral it was such a visceral like image i suppose like you know and, and literally you know men and i think there's a couple of women but mostly men were around me in like you know barbarian kind of dress like skins yeah, yeah, and yeah, furs yeah. and all the rest of it and literally just very plain round shields and like fucking pie bones or something you know yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was just bones on shields yeah. and that was the call that whoever was leading mm. that was the call and it was like bones and shields yeah was what was said and then everybody started beating and it was just yeah it was one of the most primal experiences i think i've ever had you know because yeah. it was like must have been hundreds anyway of people within this kind of immediate vicinity yeah. that it was just it's very evocative and emotive i think i used to go over to the goddess conferences in glastonbury um there's um a woman called carolyn hillier she's mm -hmm. based in dartmoor yeah she does a lot of work with drum, um, makes drums, drum making workshops, a lot of women's workshops. Her work would link more with the northern lands. She, she does a lot of stuff with like the Samai and that bringing that northern tradition. Um, but one session over there one year, so there was maybe like 300 women in a room. And so we moved into lines and to one of her chants, that kind of moving backwards and forwards towards each other with the drums beating. And I can remember just having this like incredible mm -hmm. response, mm -hmm. just like being transported back. Yeah. So I think the drums really do carry us. Yeah. There's no, there's no two ways about it, you know? It really, and if we look across those kind of indigenous tr traditions, like there's, look at the use of the drum in Native American work, yeah. again with the Samai, in Africa, you know, it's like it's yeah. through all the cultures, yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. And you know, back to the cave then as well. Like there are there are many sites where yeah. like I, I don't know anybody who's doing like sound research at sacred sites. If anybody is, let me know because I'd love to be involved in a project like that. But I think that there is a whole world of stuff that we don't know yet. There absolutely is. You know, and in caves, obviously, with the resonance and all the rest of it. But, you know, even at the acoustics at, say, Raparal, mm. um, that I mentioned earlier, like the when you're on the mound in the middle, um, 
you can be heard clearly out yeah. on the other side. Whatever way it's built, there's something about the acoustics. Yeah. And, and our ancestors knew this, and they yeah. built these sites specifically for this. So I'd love to be involved in experiments on sites. And to but even what, what sound does inside, you know, a place like that, like John and I were talking this morning um, about the cave. Mm. And when I spent a stint down there, it was part of a kind of a quest that I'd been set by my guides to spend kind of a minimum of three hours in the dark alone. And I... Because I would normally my thing would be to sing, so I sang and sang and sang, and absolutely light came in. <laughs> and you know I'd read stuff about the druids allegedly chanting and creating light, and I'd seen some documentary where they wondered about the pattern on the lintel at Newgrange being related to a sound wave right, pattern, sure. which may or may not be. You yeah. know, but they've been looking at things like this. I've also chanted and sung inside. Douth and inside the Samhain cave at Loch Crew. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a very, very powerful experience to do that. But this idea of the light coming in, I think that's that's what it means that kind of in the beginning was the word. Mm -hmm. Like the light came after the sound. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really, really interesting area of research yeah. to look at that and what, what, what it would do, you know, the resonance are these like amplifiers or you know yeah we don't know there's so much we don't know yeah yeah and in especially in a chamber you know or like a man-made chamber that or woman-made or whatever <laughs> um you know i like i have seen re research on sound where there was there's a woman who worked with underground um like constructions where she would literally she would have like two or three notes mm. But effectively, she like she would play those just those two or three notes and and bounce them mm. so that they made different notes and different yeah. sounds. Yeah, and then like had a whole, you know, song going. Yeah, just based on those those particular yeah. notes, but how they interacted with the environment. Yeah. And it's it's theoretical, of course. Don't say Laura O'Brien said, but it would not surprise me if our constructed sites worked with resonance I well I, I wouldn't be at all surprised either but uh, and I think it's more than likely the case like I do know, like we do know that sound creates patterns mm. I mean that's really demonstrable easily when I was doing a, a training in color therapy about 23 20 something years ago one of the modules was on colour and sound and as an illustration we did like lying down and somebody holding a kind of a tray with iron filings on it and um, so then we would tone or chant or whatever mm -hmm. and the iron filings would move and take a certain pattern right so that's yeah. absolute yeah. guaranteed that it creates patterns yeah so if you have like say so you have something like magnetic like they are filing so it's like look at the stones so yeah i mean and there probably is a body of research into this that Maybe there is it will be really interesting to find Comment out more about below yeah. if anybody yeah. knows yeah. you know the yeah. information that we don't have so. yeah. okay have we any other questions i think the only other question also came from john mcgowan yeah and uh, was wondering What's up and coming for Deirdre? You know, what is what is coming oh, next? Well, hopefully, fingers crossed and blessings of all the gods. Um, I have, since I stepped out of my role as a county councillor, um, for various reasons, uh, mostly to keep my sanity, um, I have been on job seekers and sliding into the back to work enterprise allowance scheme. So I have now happily gone through all the hoops and uh, sort of jumps that I've had to do, have had approval for my plan from Wexford Local Development. So I'm literally waiting for the final nod, um, which allows me to set up and get up and running with what I will call Kurasush. So that's for any of you familiar with the three cauldrons in our bardic texts and trainings the cauldron of knowledge and that's sush s-o-i-s 
very nicely gives me an acronym for School of Irish Spirituality. <laughs> so it is going to focus on training in, when I say Indigenous practices, we hold our hands up, as we've already said, we don't know exactly what our ancestors did. We can glean and make an informed uh, speculation. But what I mean by our native practices is specifically working with the land, working with the wheel of the year in these this land, um, and working with the Irish language and our mythology. So what I'm hoping to offer is what well, uh, will offer what she will well, I'm waiting, offer. Yeah, okay, right. So we're just we're just saying, <laughs> all right, God's just I I need that final little yes, go ahead, here's your start date. You can actually do this. So I kind of I don't want to count my chickens, but it's looking good at this point. So hopefully, yes, we will speak in positive things. I will be offering uh basically a circuit of uh, or a cycle of uh, quarterly workshops which i'd hope to take to all four provinces and also then a uh, training a year and a day training with a, a monthly face-to-face -face day of interaction as priestess now initially that is for women only obviously that for me as anyone who knows me will know that means anyone who identifies as a woman uh, to do this training um, as a priestess of the land, plugging into the land, learning to mediate that energy through the body, through the voice, using the Irish language and becoming familiar with the mythology and uh, becoming familiar with our sacred sites. So anyone who's interested in that, you'll see me soon enough. I'm going to have to reappear online. I've taken a hiatus for like, about 18 months now because I needed that for my sanity also but I do understand it is the modern world and technology is part of it and I will have to learn to embrace it and uh, as Laura keeps telling me about the 21st <laughs> century and I'm like is it really the 21st century already <laughs> how did that happen but anyway yes so you will hear more there's a skeleton website just waiting to be activated and stuff will go up on that and a huge thank you to brian walsh for helping me out with that that is just kind of in suspended animation waiting for the the red want to give it a main name or will i it's dear it? to com at the moment nice. yeah okay so i will put that in the links below as well yeah all you'll get is bear with us this is under construction but it will it will become active you know Oh, this is going on YouTube, so it'll be, Great. It'll be up there for, yeah. you know. So if you are looking at this in the future, hello from the past. And uh, do go and check out DeirdreWadding.com. Does that make us time ladies? It does. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and I think Brian Walsh is Esoteric Ireland, is he? Oh, he's changed the name a couple of times. Mm. Not one Sorry, Brian. Yeah, yeah, Brian, just I'll put, put the in link. a comment. Yes, yeah. yeah. I'll put the link downstairs yeah. as well, downstairs, down below. Um, so we're going to finish up there. Thank yeah, you. and yeah. thank you, we my just... wonderful sister, because <laughs> you're so good for giving me the little nudge. Like, it's very important. I am all about making sure everybody, a rising tide floats all ships. It does in you my know. arse. <laughs> they tried to tell us that, right? That's capitalistic propaganda. Well, it hasn't happened. Us. No, between us. Community. I know what you're saying. Community. I just, sorry, my political bones were like... <laughs> They told us that it didn't happen. Read the revolution. Yeah. Um, so link below for the revolution as well. So. Next <laughs> so Friday, lists. if it's not raining. <laughs> um, but do join our mailing list. You're just going to have her mailing list on deirdrewadding.com. Stop making that face. You are. And uh, you, I will be publicising your work through my mailing list as well. So Thank as you. soon as you're up and running, I will make sure that my audience is aware of our native... Magrahuagrifur! <laughs> and uh, do like and subscribe to the channel and click that bell for notifications and all of that good stuff. And Slán Bufal. Slán.